Thank you all for joining us for today's webinar on applying cervical cancer screening guidelines to case-based scenarios. My name is Jessica Monmany, and I'm the Senior Education Associate at ARHP. I will be moderating today's webinar. Before we begin, I would like to share how you can receive continuing education credit for this webinar. In order to receive credit, you must take the pre- and post-test. If you have not yet taken the pre-test, please click the link in the webinar's chat box. You can also use this box to enter questions throughout the webinar, which our presenter will answer at the end. About an hour after the conclusion of the webinar, you will receive an email from ARHP's education team with a link to the post-test survey. Your continuing education certificate will be generated upon completion of that survey. In four weeks, you will receive another email with a link to a follow-up evaluation. We ask that you complete this evaluation to let us know how you've incorporated what you learned during this webinar into your work. Completing the pre- and post-test, as well as this follow-up evaluation, helps ARHP ensure we continue to meet your educational needs and interests. Thank you in advance for your time and feedback. At this time, I would like to introduce Nicole Gettings, today's presenter. Nicole Gettings has been providing comprehensive reproductive health services in the heart of Midtown Memphis for 10 years. She has a master's in nursing from Vanderbilt University School of Nursing and is a certified nurse midwife with board certification from the American College of Nurse Midwives. Nicole offers a unique set of subspecialty skills within the field of gynecology and reproductive health that are not widely available in the Memphis and Shelby County area, including care for individuals who identify as transgender, same-sex fertility assistance, fertility evaluations for men and women, men's reproductive health services, adolescent reproductive health, HIV prevention, including PrEP and PEP, and reproductive health services for HIV-positive patients and their families. She's a speaker and educator and provides lectures across a broad array of reproductive health and sexual health specialties to other clinicians throughout the United States. We're thrilled to have us with her today, and I will hand it over to her. Nicole, you have the floor. Thanks so much, Jessica. I am always honored to work with ARHP, and thank you guys for the work that you guys do every day to make sure we have lots of resources, but also to advocate for sexual and reproductive health. Um, so Roche uh, has provided independent educational grant monies to fund this, and um, this webinar is one of several webinars in a series. There there's another one, uh, Jessica will tell you about at the end of today's presentation in a few weeks, but there have also been uh, at least two previous webinars on this topic, uh, and so I would encourage you to go back and look at those. So there are, I have personally no disclosures, and neither do the rest of the committee members. Um, I'm sorry, this slide has not been updated to reflect that. And here's our learning objectives. So um, some of the previous webinars in this series have really gone in depth into the history of HPV, HPV transmission, as well as um, very specifically looking at some of the guideline updates from uh, 2013 and 2014 from ASCCP. So I'd encourage you to go back and look at those if you have questions about guideline management. What we really want to do today is go over those guidelines in brief and then spend some time applying them to some specific case studies um, and seeing how those guidelines would work out in sort of real life scenario. Uh, so hopefully most of you guys know uh, that HPV is uh, transmitted uh, via, via really skin to skin contact. I always leave this information on this slide uh, but I really like to emphasize that each of the things you see here, so sexual intercourse, vaginal penile penetration, um, receptive anal intercourse, oral um, sex, those are really all ways that we have skin-to-skin -skin contact, and they're certainly not all of the ways that we have skin-to-skin -skin contact. Um, and, but they are, skin-to-skin -skin contact is at the basis of what causes HPV to be transmitted, and for the most part, we know that HPV is, um, you know, found in almost all people at some point in their life. So I encourage folks, don't concentrate too much on the sexual piece of this because that can be very stigmatizing, but instead think about it as skin-to-skin -skin contact and friction. 
we also know that um, some of the unfortunate, even though most of us contract HPV at some point in our life, we know that HPV is specifically linked to cervical cancer and some of the other uh, anogenital cancers we'll look at in a moment. Um, and we, we know that there are some genotypes of HPV uh, that are more likely to uh, cause cervical cancer than others, and those are listed here. We also know that just because you contract HPV doesn't mean, in fact, the large majority of people will not develop any kind of anogenital cancer, um, but there are some cofactors that are very important. Um, so I don't think anybody would be um, surprised by tobacco use or immune system disorders. Um, but the International Agency for Research on Cancer um, in 2003 released um, their comprehensive world review of research and found several other cofactors, including long-term use of OCPs as well as um, high parity, specifically uh, more than seven pregnancies full term. Uh, this webinar, we're not going to go into sort of explaining or understanding why there's those correlations, um, but certainly I would encourage you to look at the references that are there on the slide for you, um, published in 2003 and 2006, and those publications are available um, just via the web, so you don't have to have special library privileges um, to access those. I would encourage you to look at that if you have questions about that. And so despite um, advances in cervical cancer screening, despite advances in technology like HPV testing and in fact HPV genotyping, as well as advances in treatment of cervical cancer, the reality is, is we still here in the U.S. are still spending a lot of time educating and talking um, about cervical cancer and spending resources on um, finding how to best uh, prevent it in the first place, but then also screen and apply those um, secondary and tertiary treatments uh, to addressing cervical cancer. And the things you see here on the screen, uh, the fact that we still annually are seeing about 12,000 cases uh, and annually about 4,000 deaths in women, um, which is, is smaller here in the U.S. than the worldwide impact. And then, of course, the, the really large number there you see for screening that we uh, are using to address this problem in the U.S. In addition to cervical cancer, I've mentioned some other anogenitals, but also oral cancers. Um, and you can see those prevalence rates here. Um, it is particularly interesting to note that um, cervical cancer and anal, uh, so cervical cancer we know is um, related to HPV about 99.9% .9 of the time. Um, anal cancer, there's uh, about a 90% of those cases are attributable to HPV. These other cancers you see here, penile, oral, mouth, um, and then the oropharynx, they have actually slightly less, so ranging from only 3% in the oral cancers um, to up to 40% in penile cancers. Even so, you can see that there um, are some appreciable numbers of impact there. All right, so I want to talk for just a minute about uh, primary HPV um, prevention. That's one of the real advances in technology that we've seen really starting in um, the about 2006, 2007. Um, and I really wanted to go over this specifically because there have been some recent updates. So hopefully all of you guys have been uh, following HPV vaccination and those recommendations. Uh, I go into more depth in the previous webinar on this topic. But a couple of the highlights are that in 2000, in December, so just uh, about six months ago, uh, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, who is the organization here in the U.S. who makes all the recommendations on what vaccines should be administered and what ages, um, as well as evaluation of efficacy and following adverse outcomes. So in uh, December, AKIP uh, made several really important changes. So one of the changes is that for many of the populations, uh, so you can see there for females who are receiving the vaccine in the young age group between 11 and 14 or starting as young as 9, they can do just a two-dose uh, series, so uh, their initial dose and then one second dose at 6 to 12 months later. Um, that's also true for males who are getting uh, the vaccine.
The other thing in uh, December that occurred is that we no longer have some of the earlier versions, so the HPV4 and HPV2 are no longer available. We only have the HPV9 here in the U.S. And ACIP does ta uh, talk about in that publication uh, their recommendations for uh, whether that they are advising against a um, booster shot at this time, although they'll continue to monitor that. Um, and then the other category that I was particularly pleased uh, to see is that they added a specific uh, language to transgender populations. Um, so uh, one of the problems that has long been identified in, in transgender care is that many of the guidelines don't even mention transgender as a population. And uh, ACIP did a great job in this newest recommendation to actually mention them explicitly as a group. And also because of the um, prevalence of HIV infection in male to female transgender individuals, and then that increased uh, prevalence, particularly of HPV-related anal cancer, uh, they are encouraging them that they can get HPV vaccine all the way up to age 24. The recommendations are similar to the MSM population. Uh, but like all people, the for male, female, and transgender uh, populations, you can start at that younger age, and the recommendations if they get it between 11 and 14 are the same. Again, just like with the IARC document, I, I encourage you to look at, I also encourage you to look at this ACIP recommendation because it really goes into depth explaining why that age 14 cutoff, that there's a real change in the way the vaccine causes immune um, response, and that that seems to change at about age 15. And they go into a good detail explaining that and the rationale there. All right, so the rest of our presentation today is going to focus on the secondary prevention, so cervical cancer screening. And that's going to include a couple of um, different things. So just like with the ACIP and HPV vaccination changes, there have been many changes over the years. So it was way back in 1928 that Dr. Papanekolo uh, first presented his hypothesis that a smear of vaginal cells could indicate early stages of cancer. Um, the reception to that idea was not very supportive, and he really set aside that research for about another 10 years. It was not until 19. 45 that the American Cancer Society started promoting the pap smear, um, but then it took even longer for there to be widespread uptake and acceptance that this was a, a legitimate and valuable test for prevention of cervical screening. In 2000, uh, the FDA approved the first HPV screening as a diagnostic test, and that uh, gave us another tool to add to pap smears. And then in 2013, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about how the screening algorithms were changed. And as recently as April 2014, the FDA approved primary HPV screening, so HPV testing alone for women between the ages of 25 and 65. And then on the timeline there, you see that 2015 update. Um, so between 2015 and as recently as 2016, the organizations you see listed there, so ASCCP, uh, the American College of Obstetrician and Gynecologists, as well as the American uh, Cancer Society have all updated their guidelines in many ways to be um, to all be similar, but there are a few key differences that we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, so pap smears, as you hopefully are aware, uh, there are two uh, variations of pap smears. So there was the conventional uh, that has been around and is still supported, especially in low resource settings. Um, and then there's the liquid base. And both are still acceptable according to the guidelines we just talked about. Um, the advantages of the liquid base is that it allows you to do high-risk HPV testing at the same time as collection of your pap and an additional test is not needed. Um, you might want to contact your lab to find out how long they hold those specimens 
normal standard is that once you um, send in the liquid-based specimen for lab testing, that they hold it for another 30 days. So uh, if you're up to date on monitoring your results from your pap smears, uh, if you didn't order HPV and you need to do it as a follow-up test, usually if it's within that 30 days, you can do it without having to collect a, a separate sample. It's also important here, um, of course, as you see here on the slide, that you can also add gonorrhea and chlamydia testing to that same sample without a separate uh, sample being collected. Uh, it's important to talk about at this point, and this information is not on the slide, but kind of the variations in um, results uh, that you're going to get from your pap. So you can have normal, you can have ASCUS, which is the atypical squamous cells of undetermined significance. You can have LSIL, which is the low-grade intraepithelial lesion. And you can have ASCH, um, which is different than the ASCUS. The ASCH is atypical squamous cells, cannot rule out high grade. And you have HCIL. You can also have a, a separate finding called atypical glandular cells. It would be very unusual for a pap smear test to come back saying cancer at that point. And it's also very important that all the way up between, you know, normal, ASCUS, LCIL, HCIL, those tests, you can take one test and then retest a year later, and it may have either gone up or down the slide of um, increasingly or less normal. And that's important when you think about the ways that the guidelines have changed. Um, so HPV testing, uh, as I mentioned, is a tool that we've added to our toolkit. And it really allows us to better uh, evaluate whether the pap smear needs additional testing, whether we should be more or less concerned. It really allows for that stratification of risk. And it, um, one of the great things it does is it adds to our tools to really uh, select out or identify the, the few women that are going to need um, increased monitoring over time. These are a couple of the different one, uh, HPV tests that are available for you um, out on the market. It's important to know that um, some of these tests do not specifically uh, offer HPV DNA testing. And some of the newest guideline changes for some populations, HPV genotyping uh, can be quite helpful. And so we're no longer just looking for high risk versus low risk. We're actually looking for is HPV 16 or 18 present, and if not, uh, then we may not do as many advanced uh, screenings or um, increased monitoring. You are not likely to have much choice on your end about which of these tests that, you're, that are being offered to your patients. A lot of times that decision is made on the lab end of things, so I would encourage you to contact the lab that your specimens are going to and to ask them what types of tests they offer. and. Um, why they chose those specific um, tests over others. And if you feel strongly that they should be offering one of these tests and they're not, then that's definitely a recommendation I would encourage you to make to them. We're going to talk about a couple scenarios where HPV testing is, in fact, not appropriate. Um, so HPV testing does not tell you if someone has an STI. Again, just a reminder, almost everyone ends up contracting HPV at some point in our life. It is uh, it's not chlamydia or gonorrhea, and there's no increased prevalence between the two of those or other STIs as well. Um, it's not a good test to use before making that decision about vaccination. So the vaccination recommendations are not tied to sexual activity um, and not tied to whether or not someone has HPV currently. Um, there are a few scenarios we're going to talk about in a minute where it can be used for triage. Um, but in general, in otherwise low-risk women, it should not be used for triage. And um, there's a couple of special case scenarios for women over age 30 we're going to address in a minute. All right, so what are our goals of screening? Of course, we want to identify and treat the high-grade precursors. Uh, we want to um, hopefully avoid any potentially unnecessary evaluations and harmful treatment. And yes, we want to minimize costs to the healthcare system and minimize costs to women and their families uh, and individuals who have cervix uh, to avoid stigmatization and anxiety related to um, false positive tests. All in all, that can be summarized by saying we want to increase that benefit and decrease the harm there. <laughs> 
We talked about a few minutes ago that there's a few important organizations that are really the leaders in um, establishing and publishing national guidelines. Um, the ASCCP uh, is one that I will would uh, we're going to mention at least one of the tools that are available online via that organization. And um, many organizations would agree that um, they are a leader in this. Um, ACOG and USPSTF often are going to make their guidelines based on ASCCP. So ASCCP guidelines did change. Um, and I uh, apologize you don't have that reference on this slide, uh, but these were based on the 2013 um, guidelines. And um, I would encourage you, again, just like with that AKIP recommendation, I would encourage you to look at this, even though this slide is going over a few of the highlights. Uh, there are some more in-depth details that you may um, really benefit from reading the actual document. Uh, so some of the, the main changes were if there's a negative PAP or a negative cytology lacking endocervical cells, um, we can manage that without an early repeat. So we can just do that repeat about a year later in most populations of women. Um, and in young women, particularly, we, we may just wait till their next routine uh, pap smear, which may be as long as uh, three years away. Um, so in cases that your result for your histology, so now we're looking at um, beyond the results of the pap smear, but we're actually looking at uh, colposcopy and a biopsy sample. And if you get a biopsy sample of CIN1 on the endocervical curatage, then uh, you're going to, there's separate guidelines for that versus um, CIN2 or 3. Uh, back to the um, PAP screening. Uh, so you still want to do a follow-up uh, repeat sample if you get a result of unsatisfactory. And um, then one of the advantages of having the genotyping HPV is that you can um, genotype, and that may uh, make it so that you don't have to do a colposcopy or a biopsy on women who are HPV 16 or 18 negative. Um, for ASCA cytology, um, we're no longer recommending a colposcopy at all. That's going to be uh, continuing to monitor. And so this is going to be serial pap smears, so serial cytology um, at 12 months instead of the previous 6 and 12 months. If it's negative at the 12 month, then you go back to normal screening, which should be in three years in young women. Uh, a couple more summaries. So um, if HPV is negative and the ASCUS results um, are, oh, so now we're talking about a woman over age 30. Um, so if she has HPV negative, positive ASCUS on her PAP, uh, then we do want to do that co-testing at three years instead of waiting all the way until the five years that you can normally wait for in women over age 30. Um, for HPV negative and ASCUS results um, that are insufficient, uh, that should not be a reason to stop screening at age 65. And uh, the pathway to long-term follow-up of treatment of untreated CIN2 does certainly incorporate co-testing. This is sort of just a summary of the things that I just went over that may make it um, a little easier to uh, put it in your head. But again, I would really encourage you to go and look at the full documents um, and use some of the other tools that ASCCP puts out. Um, as a general rule, one of the things that um, the guidelines they put out in 2015 encourage is that um, primary high-risk HPV screening could be a cost-saving um, alternative to cytology. And that for average uh, risk women, we should not be screening annually in any circumstance. Um, and research is really supporting that. There are a few cases. Um, and by the way, ACOG updated these specific guidelines in regards to um, pap smear screening for HIV-infected individuals. 
and those were just updated in 2016. So uh, you may want to take a look at that. Um, they, ACOG does continue to uh, support increased screening in HIV infection and immunosuppression, although ASCCP has done away with those as separate categories. All right, some of the um, special populations that it is important to talk about, um, so uh, sexual minority women, um, and usually that is in regards to um, women who identify as female and who are sleeping with other females. They're often screened at a lower rate, and that's not only, uh, there's a whole variety of factors that contribute that. One of the factors has to do with providers um, have historically been found not to offer screening uh, if they are aware that she is not heterosexual uh, because of a misperception uh, in the idea that she may be at risk for cervical cancer. Um, there are other contributing factors to that, and one of it also being that uh, women who identify as sexual minority females uh, sometimes see themselves at less at risk uh, because of the way that HPV is presented as an STI. They uh, will, research has supported that they consider themselves less at risk for STIs in general, and they would include HPV in that, and so they feel that they're less at risk for cervical cancer. But then there's also systemic barriers, such as lack of insurance, hopefully uh, with some of the changes uh, that we've seen in the last, in June of 2016, with, uh, on the federal end of things, supporting equality in marriage, that that has begun to address some of those types of equalities. Um, having said all of that, um, it is important to, to recognize that uh, precancerous cervical lesions have been detected in women who have never had a heterosexual sexual contact, so no uh, penile uh, contact with men, um, and that their recommendations in sexual minority women are not different from all other people with a cervix. Um, transgender individuals face a couple of specific guide, uh, barriers in addition to the ones we talk, just talked about. Um, so one is it's very important to remember that transgender men uh, do not undergo genital reconstruction surgery at very high rates, so certainly some do, but there's a large proportion who retain their cervix. Um, there's also, um, if they have had reconstructive surgery, it's important for them and for you as your, their provider to um, evaluate uh, whether asking them or doing an exam um, to find out whether their cervix was left intact or whether they had a complete hysterectomy. Um, they, transgender individuals, may, made several decisions about keeping their cervix, keeping their um, ovaries or not keeping any of those organs. Um, and that's going to be an individual um, decision. Uh, one of the things that we talked about earlier with the AKIP uh, vaccination recommendations is that they've done a great job of, um, in fact, including transgender, but most of the other cervical cancer screening guidelines have not included mention of transgender. And it's my hope we're going to start to see that change. Nonetheless, just like all sexual gender minority individuals, the screening guidelines are not different. Um, there are a few um, specific things you need to be aware of. If the individual is on testosterone, it may make it more difficult to collect a specimen because the cervical cells are more likely to be um, atrophied from um, testosterone use. Um, so in women with CIN2 or higher, ASCCP and ACOG um, both recommend that they should continue for routine age-based screening for 20 years after the initial post-treatment, um, even if that requires screening past age 65. So what's, that's one of those guideline changes. Another special population is um, individuals with in utero exposure to DES. So um, currently, you're not likely to have a large proportion of um, patients that you're going to be seeing so there were about 5 to 10 million Americans um, and the pregnant women who were exposed to DAS in the 1940s um, up to 1971, so between those years. And children born to those women 
have been shown to have increased risk in several areas, and one of the areas is cervical cancer. So for if you do have someone that fits in that age category uh, and was one of those uh, who was exposed, you may need to continue to um, screen all the way past age 65, and those are still considered annual screening uh, because of the increased risk of cervical cancer, but also because of increased risk of not having PAPs done routinely. Um, so the age that women would be right now uh, would be between 46 and 77 years of age. That might help you kind of know who might be um, potentially have been um, exposed. So this is one where there are a couple of differences. So the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists recommends annual pelvic exams. Uh, but the cervical cytology pap smears are not recommended at increased risk, um, so that should follow whatever the normal standard is. And NCI, um, they are saying an annual um, cervical and vaginal cytology, and they're not doing any kind of age cutoff. All right. So um, this is about some of those changes, and this is one specific to women over age 30, and this is that primary, uh, no, this is not primary screening with HPV testing alone. This is for women over age 30 with a negative PAP and positive HPV results. What do you do in that situation? Uh, you go ahead and move to genotyping. If the genotyping is positive for 16 or 18, then you would go on and progress to the immediate colposcopy. If it's negative, you still do do increased screening, but you can wait for 12 months and just collect an additional PAP and then um, see what that result comes back as. Um, so I've mentioned a couple of times the tools that ASCCP guide offers. So there's actually a mobile app for your iPhone and your Android, um, and it's a great tool that I would highly encourage you to use. It really allows you to look at the plug in the patient's age, her pregnancy status, um, and then it will help walk you through the guidelines. Um, it, I, I don't believe it's free. I believe it's something along the lines of $10. But uh, if you're doing PAPs frequently or infrequently, um, I really say that this is a great investment of just a few dollars um, and can really save you a lot of time and energy looking those guidelines up. All right. So I'm... Um, uh, so at this point, we're going to kind of move into our um, key points about counseling, and then we'll wrap up by doing the case studies. Um, it is going to be really important that you've spent some time really um, looking at these documents I've mentioned, using some of these tools I've mentioned, because in order to convey to women, um, you know, I know for myself, I still have women that get calls, for example, from their insurance company telling them that they need to go in for their annual exam. And for a long time, that meant going in for your PAP. So it really takes some additional time and communication between the provider and your individual client or patient um, to explain why the guidelines have changed, that you still want to see them regularly. That doesn't necessarily mean you need to do a pap smear, but that time can be spent doing other things and building your repertoire of what other things you can spend that time with, whether it's doing more in-depth contraceptive counseling or talking more in depth about STI or smoking risk um, or obesity and weight loss, those are all things that you could do instead of doing this collection of a pap smear that sort of made it a, a practical thing that you had to do every year. And you really need to be comfortable with that and be able to explain that to your patients. Um, so one of the, the unfortunate additional um, tasks that is important is really doing your history taking and getting those prior results, that really becomes important with these new guidelines and understanding what the next steps are for that woman. And she may not have uh, been given those results to carry forward. Uh, for example, if she's moved or relocated, um, one of the vulnerable populations addressed in one of the other series is uh, migrant communities and homeless individuals. So she may not have access to those records. And it's going to be important that um, you do some of that um, homework and um, getting those records so that you can help her make the best decision. And I think we talked a little bit about education. Um, so to do all of that record getting, you really need to ask her and value her input about her history. Um, you know, 
there's a variety of tools that are publicly available to help put around your office, um, posters and things, um, and also handouts and things that you can use to help um, educate and um, help go through the key points with, with patients who are often as confused about these changes in guidelines. Um, it's important to communicate the thing we talked about earlier, that HPV is transmitted skin-to-skin -skin contact, and that many women, once they um, have HPV positive, most of those infections will come back undetectable within two years. And it's only when that persistent HPV stays around for a long time, so up to 10 years, um, that we see problems. Um, and it, it's also really important to help women understand that the majority of people, in fact, do not develop HPV-related cervical cancer. All right, I think we went through most of these. I'm anxious to get to our case studies. So I also think we, we kind of covered these. All right, here's our case studies. So I have been interested to see how this will go over um, a webinar because, of course, one of the disadvantages is that I can't get audience input for these case studies, but we'll try. Um, so our 43-year-old teacher is a Gravita 1 P1. She's got a 9-year-old daughter. She was divorced two years ago, and she has recently started a new relationship that she's been in for about six months. Um, so some additional information. Um, she's healthy. She has no significant medical issues. She takes a multivitamin daily and uses condoms for contraception. Um, she's unsure when her last cervical cancer screening was. Uh, she thinks that her last pap may have been three years ago, and she's pretty sure it was negative, but she doesn't have those results with her, uh, and you don't have access to her previous provider. Um, her menstrual cycle is regular. Uh, she has no significant problems with that, and her last menstrual cycle uh, was two weeks ago. So what do you do? Um, so be thinking about questions uh, and, and how to approach uh, whether or not you recommend cervical cancer screening at this point. Um, you would want to look at those guidelines for women who fall in the age category of 30 and older. Um, so in this case, she may want to consider doing a PAP. You also definitely would want to talk about co-testing and the advantages of co-testing. And remembering that co-testing does not mean genotyping in this case. Um, so she's also concerned about um, possibly HPV transmission from her ex-husband because she felt that um, part of what led up to the divorce was um, her, her ex-husband was, was in a relationship with someone else. And she's really worried about that. And that's a common scenario that's going to present that you want to talk about. The HPV is not related to someone else um, having another relationship. The HPV is really commonly transmitted. And that um, although she can certainly utilize condoms, they're not going to protect her from HPV transmission in general. So after discussion, she decides to um, do a pap test as well as gonorrhea and chlamydia testing. And um, you're going to get back with her in about two weeks with those results. Her results are uh, that her pap smear was negative, but her HPV was positive. And so in that scenario, what would we want to do and what, what would we want to think about with that? So um, you know, talking to her about the things I mentioned about it, it's not related to her partner being unfaithful. Um, and even though HPV does have a higher, um, that we know cervical cancer is caused by HPV, it takes a long time for that HPV to be around. And the majority of women who um, acquire HPV do not, in fact, develop cervical cancer. All the same, we're going to recommend that she have another PAP in about 12 months. And um, one of the other options we can talk to her about is genotyping. And if the genotyping 1618 had been positive, we could have proceeded on to a colposcopy. Um, so that's an option that you could have offered her, certainly, is to do that genotyping when that, with that initial HPV, or I'm sorry, PAP normal, but HPV negative. All right. 
another of the vulnerable populations that um, one of the webinars in this series concentrated on was immigrant populations. Um, so we wanted to talk a minute about RW. RW is a 42-year-old Ethiopian immigrant. Um, she's Muslim. She has been living with HIV. She's married and has two healthy HIV-negative children. Um, so during the immigration process, the health department recommended a follow-up visit. Uh, she doesn't speak English, so you're using the language line um, to access translation services. Um, she does bring up during your conversation that she's not had access to her HIV medications for a couple of months uh, due to the transition, uh, but otherwise she feels well. She doesn't have any fever, rash, headache, abnormal vaginal bleeding, or GI symptoms. And her HIV, she does say that she was undetectable in Ethiopia on a three-pill regimen. Um, and she's able to identify which pill she was on by looking at a HIV medication chart, pill chart. Um, so it, she's not familiar at all with cervical cancer screening. And when you mention to her that it's uh, – a screen for HPV, which can be sexually transmitted, she reassures you that she's sure she's not at risk for anything sexually transmitted because she's only had one sexual partner, which is her current husband, and her husband is there with her. And she's certain that she's not going to get any other STIs. Um, so at that point, what are some of the things that you could be thinking about, talking to her about? Um, of course, one of the main concerns are that she uh, has HIV and is off of her medication. So if you're able to treat that, um, then you definitely want to, it's clear from the information she's giving you that she's worried about this and she'd like to get back on her medications. And you also really need to talk with her more extensively about what a PAP is and understanding what it screens for and um, perhaps considering explaining that HPV is really skin-to-skin -skin contact. Um, and that most people have it, and it's often spread with sexual contact. Um, you may have to really, especially in someone who is not uh, able to speak the same language as you are, you may need to use some of those general anatomy charts and um, you know, find that, that actual diagrams or pictures or models are quite helpful in discussing what the cervix is and where it is. Um, after you've discussed this at some length with these, uh, this couple, uh, the patient's husband explains that she clearly doesn't need screening because he doesn't have any kind of cancer and he's not concerned. Um, so at that point, you may need to do some additional um, education. You may also want to consider sending them home with some information to look at. So you do send them home with some information and they come back. And um, they are willing to do a cervical cancer screening at that second visit. And when that second visit comes, she arrives, the visit goes smoothly, and you schedule another follow-up visit in one week to discuss the results. It is important, especially if your office protocol is that you don't normally meet with your patients for their normal results, you may want to consider um, routinely scheduling someone who doesn't speak English because the translation over the phone or via mailing their results may not be very helpful. Her test results come back, and they are LSIL, um, and her HPV test is positive for high risk, but you've not done any genotyping. Um, so you will need to um, meet with her and explain to her a colposcopy. It may be an option to offer her a colposcopy at that follow-up visit, but recognizing the translation difficulties and the amount of education you need to spend with her, it may also help to separate those visits. Um, it is apparent from her uh, commitment to coming back at this point that she is coming back routinely, and um, although loss to care could be a concern, she continues to express commitment to coming in, and she's also happy that you're able to provide her HIV medications. I'm sorry. Uh, yep. So finally, we're going to talk about um, Alex. Alex is a transgender patient, 23-year-old transgender male. He works in retail. Um, he started a medical transition with testosterone about two years ago. He's not had any problems. 
Um, he has a provider who's prescribing that form. He doesn't need you to do that. He uh, admits that he's never had a PAP previously, um, and he doesn't believe that he had the HPV vaccination. He denies any sexual contact with any males and is currently active with one female partner uh, for the last six months, but has had previous partners in the past. Um, he really comes in today purposely kind of concerned. Some of his um, transgender friends have mentioned that they were going to get PAPs, and it made him feel like he should maybe go in and get additional information. So um, he is over age 21, so you do want to go ahead and recommend a PAP. Um, he is still within the age category, so he's under age 24, so he's still certainly eligible per the AKIP recommendations to get the HPV vaccine. Um, and he would need the three-dose system. And other tests that you would still encourage would be routine STI testing for gonorrhea, chlamydia, HIV, and syphilis. Um, and then you may want to consider any other recommendations. I did not talk about it on the last slide. I apologize. I skipped over that. Um, he is a previous smoker. And if you remember some of the cofactors that um, HPV is more likely to um, develop into cervical cancer in the case of, of tobacco use, uh, that may be a concern. So the last slide told you that he had actually quit smoking three a couple of months previous to this visit, uh, but he had smoked three years before that. Um, so again, similar to our other um, ones that we've talked about so far, you want to talk about how HPV is transmitted, that it's not dependent on intercourse with a male. Um, you want to talk about and acknowledge that in transgender individuals, sometimes we do see higher prevalence of cervical cancer, but it's related to lack of screening. And you really want to encourage and um, promote the fact that he has stopped smoking and talk to him about the benefits of that and really encourage him to continue on that path. Um, you want to encourage the STI testing, which does not require a pelvic exam, um, and you want to go over those HPV vaccination results with him. Uh, so today he says, thank you very much for the information. Um, he feels a little bit anxious, and he'd like to come back at a separate visit when his girlfriend can come with him. Um, so it might be, um, however, he says he definitely feels comfortable in your office and that your staff was very kind to him, and he didn't feel disrespected when he called and made his appointment. And so he really feels encouraged to come back. Um, and he wants to know if you can help him think about any other things that he may do to calm down during the PAP exam. Um, and you can do several things, you know, anywhere from encouraging them to um, use music therapy, so encouraging them to come in with headphones might be one option. I've had many, many folks do that over the years. I've had folks, um, I've really encouraged them, look, if you need to wear your cowboy boots, that's just fine. There's no reason that you have to take your cowboy boots off. Uh, you can have your PAP and your cowboy boots. Another option is to talk about self-collected PAPs. Although that's not a recommended guideline, there are several organizations that have been looking into that, especially in vulnerable populations, um, that it may be helpful to use a self-collected PAP. Um, he does come back, and um, he does get his PAP, and his PAP results were normal. And... Um, so in this case, because he is under age 30, you do not need to do co-testing. And um, you do need to encourage him to come back at the six months for his second HPV vaccination, and then one more time at 12 months for the third vaccination. And that's it. So we have about 12 minutes left for questions. That's Perfect. a good time to see him, Nicole. Yeah. Um, so at this point, we will start taking questions that have been entered into the question and answer box. And our first question comes from Barbara, who asks if the slides will be available to print. And the answer is yes, Barbara, they will. Um, I'll go over that in a little more detail at the conclusion of the webinar, but we do have a course site on ARHP that stores all of that information. 
I will say on my end, thank you, Jessica, for that answer. I will also say if you've never looked at the core, and that's C-O-R-E, um, I would really encourage you to. They have lots of slide sets that you can utilize yourself um, and insert them into presentations you're doing. Absolutely. Um, we'll also be circulating a link to the ASCCP guidelines to participants and those who couldn't join us today in a follow-up email. Okay. Our next question comes from Pamela, who asks, what is the risk for women with CES exposure to be diagnosed with clear cell cancers in the next five years? What is the rationale for continued PAP after the age of 65 in this group of women? Yeah, thanks, Pamela. That's a really um, a good question. Um, and just one second, because um, so you had a couple of questions there. So one was about clear cell carcinoma, um, which we did not talk about. It's specific to DES. And um, statistics seem to indicate uh, one is that clear cell carcinoma is not related to HPV, so it's important to remember that. Um, and in DES patients, um, there is a 40-fold increase for clear cell carcinoma. However, um, overall lifetime risk, even in the DES exposed population, is low about 1 per 1,000 to 2,000. Um, so that's kind of the first part of your question. And then you asked a quick second part of your question um, regarding the rationale of continued pap smears after age 65. And that one is a little bit hard to answer. And one of the reasons it's hard to answer is because there certainly are disagreements in the guidelines um, about, uh, you know, whether or not you should continue screening. Um, ACOG specifically addresses it in their October 2016 bulletin uh, entitled Cervical Cancer Screening Prevention Interim Update. And that's ACOG number 168. Um, the uh, ASCCP guidelines don't address DS specifically. Um, and so you really do have to kind of look at all the guidelines overall. And of course, you remember on one of those slides, it, there's at least one organization that still says there's no age cutoff. Um, so there's lots of information there to tease through. And, and I wish I could give you a clear cut answer. I think part of the, the not clear cut answer is because the guidelines are not very clear. Great, thank you so much. Our next question is from Mary who asks, is it still recommended to do an HPV with an ASCUS result on ages 20 to 24? <laughs> That's a great question. That's one of my favorite um, questions. <laughs> um, so, when I get asked these questions, I will be honest, I have to always look at the thing. Um, Jessica, I'm sorry, can you tell me what age group she asked again about? Sure, 20 to 24. 20 to 24, so one or is 20, 20 years old, <laughs> right. So one is 20 years old, hopefully you're not doing anything. Um, so you're asking specifically about the 21 to 24 age group. And were you asking about unsatisfactory or ask us? Ask us. Right, so no, you don't do genotyping at that age group. Great, thank you. Our next question is from Tracy who asks, following a new diagnosis of HIV, is it recommended to screen at six and 12 months or is within 12 months sufficient? <laughs> I love that question, Tracy. <laughs> um, thank you for asking that. This is another one that, um, if you're familiar with the history of the, the guidelines, so the ASCCP guidelines recommended stopping handling HIV as a separate category altogether. So they no longer recommended that that be an appropriate division on how you manage guidelines. They should be, HIV infected individuals should be um, monitored according to guidelines just like everyone else. 
Now, that being said, all of the organizations are not um, in agreement about that. The December 20, I'm sorry, October 2016 guidelines from ACOG do still encourage a 12 and or a six and a 12 month, um, but they're moving more in the direction of ASCCP guidelines. And then the other guidelines that were also updated in 2016, uh, and I'm going to say this wrong and I apologize, but there are specific guidelines that were updated from the major HIV screening organization that the name of the organization is not in front of me. Uh, those were also updated in 2016. They do continue to um, encourage the 6 and the 12 month uh, as those initial screening with newly diagnosed HIV. Um, I hope that was helpful. I encourage you to read those guidelines. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and everyone will be able to read those guidelines once we send out the follow-up emails after today's webinar. Our next question comes from Bruce, who asks, which patients would you consider high risk and in need of increased monitoring or screening? Yeah, um, and, and that's certainly gotten trickier with these new guidelines. So one of the things is that, um, you know, increased screening can be determined by a couple different variables. Sexual activity is really no longer considered an appropriate um, measure for whether or not someone should get increased screening. So we no longer have the guideline of, you know, doing it a pap by 21 or within three years of sexual activity because we no longer consider that an appropriate measure. Um, age can be an appropriate measure, so you want to look at results across age categories. So 21 to 24 year olds have much lower risk altogether. So their guidelines are really separate and don't call for as much frequent um, screening. After age 24 and then certainly after age 30, there are increased screening um, recommendations based on the abnormal result if and when that comes back. Um, so in cases of abnormal results in those age categories, we may have a little more increased screening. And then there's some populations such as smokers um, and uh, HIV infected individuals as well as DES individuals that we still do consider some of the guidelines consider separately. Great, thank you. Our next question comes from Kate who asks if a patient is HPV positive but has a normal pap test, does that reflect an increased risk for either a false negative pap test result or the development of cancer? Yeah, so her PAP is negative, if I understood that correctly. And yes. so, okay, sure. And so her HPV is positive. Um, at that point, that's one of the great things that genotyping adds. So um, she has a positive HPV, but you don't know if it's positive for specifically 16 or 18. Um, and then the other thing you want to consider there is her age. So if she's over age 30, you do want to follow that up with genotyping, and if it's positive for 16 or 18, you can go on and proceed to a colposcopy. If it's negative for 16 or 18, you do want to do some increased monitoring, but you can wait and just do a repeat um, pap smear at 12 months. Perfect. Thank you. And we have just a minute maybe for our last question, which sort of follows up on that and asks, what are some circumstances in which HPV genotyping testing should not be used? Sure. So we went over a couple of those. One is that you don't want to use HPV testing to determine whether or not someone should get the vaccine. Um, that's not an appropriate screen for that. You don't want to use HPV testing as a screen for STIs of any kind. And you don't want to use HPV screening in young women um, to determine whether or not they need a PAP. But um, over age 30, you can use co-testing, so the PAP plus HPV, to determine how frequently a woman over age 30 needs to continue to have her PAPs. Perfect. Thank you so much for those great answers, and thank you to everyone else for all of your excellent questions. Um, we have addressed a lot of these topics in the previous webinars in this series, so do check out ARHP.org to view all of those. At this point, Nicole, would you like to review the key points for us? Sure. All right, so we know cervical cancer is caused by HPV, but we know it takes that persistent infection. 
Um, we also um, know that we don't need to do pap screening as frequently in the majority of average risk women. Um, and that that recommendation really came from a large body of research supporting that. Um, even though we still recommend PAPs between ages 21 to 24, they have a separate algorithm that um, really encourages, um, you know, less invasive screening and more wait and see kind of um, guidelines to determine if there's any increased need for monitoring. Uh, that genotyping, like we talked about, can be used for women over age 30. And then um, in most situations, except the ones we mentioned um, with DES and um, some we didn't talk about, which is organ transfers, um, most of the time stopping at age 65 is appropriate for all women of average risk. Great. Thank, Thank you so much. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> no, you're good, Jessica. <laughs> okay. Thank you again for joining us, and thank you to everyone else for joining us as well. Before we end today's webinar, I just have a few additional reminders. Be sure to visit ARHP.org to register for the next webinar in this series taking place on Wednesday, May 10th, and to view on-demand webinars from earlier in this series. You may also download a copy of this presentation by visiting core.arhp.org. As a reminder, you will receive an email from ARHP's education team in about an hour containing a link to the post-test survey. Your CME or nursing CE certificate will be generated at the end of that survey. Be sure to print the certificate before closing your internet browser. If you have questions, please email us at education at ARHP.org. Thank you again for joining us today. We hope you will take part in other live and on-demand sessions hosted by ARHP.